Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Courtney Conley and I'm a reporter for CNBC Make It. And today we are in for an exciting conversation with former New York Stock Exchange traders, Lauren Simmons and Martina Edwards, who both made history on the floor. Lauren and Martina, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us, Thank Courtney. you for having us. Very awesome. excited to be yes, here. Yes, yes. And so we have a lot to talk about today. So I wanna dive right into it. As I mentioned, both of you made history on the floor. Lauren, in 2017, at just 22 years old, you became the youngest full-time female trader at the New York Stock Exchange, as well as just the second Black woman to hold that role. And then more than a decade before you, Martina, in 2004, you became the first Black woman trader on the floor when you were hired by Merrill Lynch. And so for both of you, can you just give us brief insight into how long each of you worked on the floor and what was that experience like? And, and Lauren, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, so I was on the floor for about two years. I thoroughly enjoyed my time on the trading floor. I, I learned so much. I was eager to grow and learn. It was my first job uh, out of college. And uh, I, I was just so excited to be in a new environment. And out of all places to have landed at the New York Stock Exchange, especially because it wasn't anything that I sought out. I, I came from a background uh, in genetics with a genetics degree. And uh, through the power of networking, I, I landed, you know, at the most one of the most iconic places here in America. So I'm so grateful for the opportunity. Awesome. And what about you, Martina? What was your experience like on the floor and how long did you work there? Yes. Um, so I started in 2001. Uh, I spent five years working on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, similar to Lauren, it wasn't something that I dreamed about doing. Um, I actually had a chance to do a summer internship and get the opportunity um, but the the stock exchange was, I agree, a wonderful place still to this day. It's the largest global exchange by market capitalization to date. It was fast paced, action packed. Um, in 2001, I actually started um, reporting to the floor the week of 9-11. So it was a summer time um, for the markets. It was heightened volatility because of the Internet of Things. So it was the uh, 1999 kind of or the 90s. Uh, boom and subsequent bust of, of, of a lot of stock, uh, internet stocks. And then it was just fast paced, action packed. Um, I remember seeing my work play out on CNBC and Bloomberg every day. So for, for a young girl coming from Alabama, um, it was perfect. And even though it was intense and stressful, uh, at the same time, people took themselves, uh, were very lighthearted and didn't take themselves too seriously. So it was, it was good times. Awesome. And, and both of you mentioned that you didn't initially set your sights out on having a career in finance. And so I would love for both of you all just to kind of dig into your path a bit, because I know that in college, neither one of you initially started out as, as a finance major. And I know, Lauren, as you mentioned, you graduated with a degree in genetics. So share with us a bit how you went from graduating with a degree in genetics to landing an opportunity to work at the New York Stock Exchange. So for me, I knew I wasn't going to pursue genetics. I wanted to go into genetic counseling. And for anyone who knows or doesn't know, but one of the things that they do is they test both parents to see if a child will have any genetic abnormalities. I thought we were at a point in technology that we would be able to alter DNA. I have a twin brother um, with disabilities, and I really wanted to impact um, people's lives the way the doctors had impacted mine growing up. Fast forward to writing my senior thesis, I realized that it's illegal to alter DNA. Um, and so I had to pivot. And what I did know was that I wanted to move to New York. Um, I wasn't completely sure on what that looked like or, or what um, job outcome that would be. But December 13, 2016, I got on a plane the day I graduated and I moved to New York uh, through the power of networking, which, mind you, I wasn't necessarily looking for anything in finance. I was looking for anything that I could rely heavily on my statistics background, because I had a strong background in that. And um, I met a man at Goldman uh, and they told me two minutes into our conversation, he said, Goldman will not hire you, um, but there is an equity trading position open at the New York Stock Exchange and would I be open to taking that position? And of course I said, yes, I was so eager. I was so excited. Um, we'll we'll get into the pay but you know for me i thought this would be a platform this would be a foundation i will do two years i knew that the day that i walked onto that floor i will do two years and i will go on um and do something else within binance um and so i i just i just was so eager and so grateful and 
still am for the for the opportunity and for someone to essentially tap me on my shoulder and say you would be good for this apply for this and all i you know needed to do was say yes and and go from there awesome and what about you martina because i i know that you initially actually started college correct me if i'm wrong as a nursing major <laughs> that's right i did um i made the switch like so many students um I was really good with numbers and I liked definitive solutions. I had a dean who uh, was able to sit down and talk to me about what type of career I could have if I went into finance. I'd interned the summer before at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. Um, a, another student had come from New York um, and had an internship there and she raved about it. So I actually got my foot in the door to Wall Street through a program called SEO, Sponsors for Education Opportunity. It is a program that is the chief provider of diverse talent to Wall Street firms for undergraduates of color. And um, I had an amazing summer coming from Alabama. It was the concrete jungle, it was boisterous. There was a lot of energy in New York City. And I finished my, uh, my, my, my internship. I had a free week where Merrill was allowing you to you know, go into another division and see what that was like. Um, I spent most of my time on the equity trading desk. So I remember they were talking to folks on the other end, lots of screaming and yelling. I wanted to see what that was about. So I got a chance to go work, go to the floor for a day. And the energy and buzz of the floor was a game changer for me. I had a chance to go out with then CNBC reporter, um, Maria Bartiromo. She took me out to where she reported. And I knew in that moment that that pace was what I wanted. And uh, I got my offer at the end of the summer and I actually requested to go back to the exchange. That's how I literally got there. Hey, can, I, can I just say, Courtney, um, me and Martina, obviously we're connected by, you know, making history and being on the floor, but we're also connected by our bosses. Um, most people don't know that. Martina, do you wanna tell her like, Yes, do Who share, your please. Who your bosses? Are you talking about Dave, Dave yeah. O'Day? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes. So, Dave O'Day currently still runs the floor for, for Merrill, and uh, he's, he was my second boss. He, he took over the floor afterwards, but um, Dave O'Day has always been really great, you know, providing me with recommendations over the years. And I remember the, the interesting conversation when, when, story, when Lauren's story came out. And I started to get these calls and text about it. I thought, oh my gosh, it's amazing. I want to tell her how proud I am and how can I connect with her? And the power of, of social networking, I actually utilized LinkedIn, sent her a note. And I don't know if Lauren remembers, I said from broker 879 to broker 811, um, I am so proud of you. I want to let you know that um, I understand the magnitude of this accomplishment and that we might have some shared experiences. And within 48 hours, we were on a phone call. And I remember Lauren saying to me at the time, I didn't know if you were real. I didn't know if you were real. So that was a really, um, a really cool moment um, where she had heard about that, that maybe that someone had come, come before, but she didn't really know all the details. Yeah, and and Dave O'Day was her second boss, but my direct boss at the time was uh, Bobby Greason. But under him was Ryan O'Day, who's Dave O'Day's son. And so to to have that connection and to have had these women work under you know you know I guess essentially the O'Days, it's just we're more connected in a, in a lot more ways than not. I mean, even both coming from the South, kind of coming from medical backgrounds and making our way onto the floor. So. Um, you know, I'm so grateful that Martina reached out. She was one of the few women to reach out and, and just encourage me and really wanted to me to share my story with her. But I, I think more than anything, really wanted to hear from her. I, I you know, want to hear from all the women that have previously worked on the trading floor if, if you know, they would want to. But I, I was so grateful that she was so gracious and just was so kind. And and uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I know that we've been doing this for a couple of years now, but but thank you so much for reaching out to me. I'm, I'm so grateful for it. Oh, absolutely. Awesome, awesome, and then that 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 whole connection and Martina, you reaching out is is so beautiful because Lauren, I know even when we first told your story in 2018, you mentioned that at the time you were the only full time female trader on the floor um, mm -hmm. at that time. So during your duration there, did other women join you on the floor? Like what 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 did it look like there? Did, and then Martina, same for you. Um, during your time at the New York Stock Exchange, were there other women on the floor? Just kind of what the diversity looked like there. 
So obviously, and Martina, she'll she'll share share her story. But obviously, throughout the years, the New York Stock Exchange has has gotten significantly smaller as far as the the amount of people that are on the floor. It used to be, from my understanding, many many different rooms and over thousands of people that used to work there. Uh, while I was there, it was only about two hundred and fifty men, and I being the only woman. There was um, towards the end of my time on the trading floor. I think my last year, another lady had joined. She was a senior lady um, and she had previously worked on the floor, came back, was working on the floor. Um, I tried to, you know, have conversations with her, but, you know, I, I it, it's very interesting times. And, and you know, I felt like because um, we were the only woman on the floor that we can lean and support each other. Um, but I don't think that she felt the same way and you know it is what it is people are people and you kind of just move forward but yeah there there was an additional woman that that joined the trading floor and what about you martina what what was the experience like for you in the trading floor were you the only woman as well were there other women on the floor um there were other women on the floor when i worked at the shame at the exchange it was obviously still very male dominated um, for me, I became a historical first for Merrill Lynch, so I was the only African-American female trader uh, on the floor during my time there, and I was the only uh, Black female broker on the entire exchange representing all firms. And I think it's hard for people to sometimes conceptualize what the New York Stock Exchange is, so I liken it to the NFL. So the NFL is this umbrella organization that has 32 teams underneath, um, and then there's specialized positions like a quarterback. And so for the New York Stock Exchange, it is a representation of a number of different investment firms. And those investment firms um, to, to gain access to trade during the time when I was there. It's important to note from uh, the pre-2006, the exchange was a private organization. So now mm -hmm. it's publicly traded. So to gain access to the, one of those specialized positions as a broker, you actually had to be a member or own a seat. And the cost of seats, the values went up and down. Um, and this comes from the history of when the exchange is over 200 years old, that men used to literally sit in a circle in a chair and trade stocks one by one. So that nomenclature of a seat is to gain access to be able to trade, you actually had to own or lease the seat. Mm -hmm. um, Merrill made a substantial investment on my behalf to allow me to gain rights to that seat. Um, so, so that's what's, and, and I don't think even while I was there, I knew I was a historical first, as, as Lauren said, it was not until her story broke, to be honest, that it hit me the magnitude of the accomplishment because it was like, oh my gosh, if Lauren is the second, does that mean I'm the first in the history of the New York Stock Exchange? So it was, um, it, you know, this this real surreal moment of, wow, um, you know, lots of folks were, were there and congratulatory of me being a historical first first for Merrill, but I I don't think we really understood the significance. And I know I didn't understand the significance at the time. And and back to what Martina was saying as far as like gaining access being a member, right? So when we talk about me and Martina were very clear and we want people to really understand, you know, history especially when it pertains to the New York Stock Exchange and the women that have been down there. There was another woman, incredible woman, who was the first um, African-American seed holder who was Gail Pinky. And I make sure that I recognize her in all of my interviews. Like, I don't want people to get confused. That means I, the third African-American yeah. woman, but the second African-American equity trader. She was the first African-American seed holder. Um, and I believe, was it in the 70s she gained access to that seat? Martina. I'm not sure what year it was, but what we do know, what's really what's on the books for the New York Stock Exchange is that um, Muriel Siebert uh, was the first uh, was woman first to own a seat, mm -hmm. and that was in the 60s. Was it the late 60s? Yeah. The late, yeah. It was the late 60s. I think it was 67. Yeah. So, you know, it's in, and I became a broker in 2004. Mm -hmm. So you're only talking about a difference of about 50 years there, but um, yeah, we, we definitely want to honor and pay homage to, to Gail. When I signed the book, um, and, you know, when you become a broker, you sign this big book and it's, they have an archive, it's at the New York Stock Exchange. So honestly, I feel like we should be able to figure this information out. But uh, I remember asking, was there anybody before me? And folks said, well, we think there's someone who doesn't actively trade, which is why I tend to say I was the um, first actively, you know, the only actively trading uh, female, bro black female broker at the time. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And we're, we're definitely going to get into the conversation of diversity on the floor and progress that's been made and progress that still needs to be made. But 
before we get there, um, I want to go back a bit because I think often when you hear about a New York Stock Exchange trader, you often you know perceive it as a very high paying job. Um, but Lauren, actually, recently in a Business Insider article, you revealed that you actually were only paid twelve thousand dollars a year during your time on the floor. Um, and I think a lot of people were shocked to hear that number. Can you is, is that a normal salary for that position? Were other peers on the floor making that amount of money? Can can you share with, with us? Um, so we have had our personal sidebar conversations over the past week. So I'm I'm still processing a lot. If, if I'm being frank to anyone that's watching today, um, was that a typical salary? From from what I'm hearing now, that was not. Um, I thought it was. So you know. That's why I love that we are here today talking about equal pay and having conversations around salary. I, I think, you know, and, and I'll get into your question in a second, but I think going forward, I just, the, the, the conversation around salary should not be taboo. We should be openly having conversations around it because I think what often happens when we don't have these conversations, it's usually minorities that are the ones, and not just African-American women, I'm talking about women, Asians, Latinos, et cetera, et cetera, that aren't involved in these conversations and aren't getting paid what they should be. And now with that being said, yes, I'm, my take home during that time was $12,670. I had a conversation with Richard Rosenblatt last week who, you know, I, I still respect him in so many ways. He's been such a great mentor to me. He gave me this opportunity. I wouldn't have done this uh, without working for Rosenblatt Security. So really all the men, the, the whole team there, I'm truly, truly grateful for them all. But with that being said, I do think that you can be a great human being as he is, have the best intentions and, and still not get it right. Um, pretty much what materialized out of, out of the conversation that I had with him was that he started on the floor making $4,900 a year. Um, and so I guess that just boiled down to, it was okay that I was only making 12,000. And at the end of the day, I guess it was right. Because, you know, I, I was since have left and I went on and having a very successful career. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, but I, I think, yeah, I'm now seeing my experience at the New York Stock Exchange a little bit different because yeah, I had a conversation with a trader today who told me he was there about seven, 10 years ago. He's still there, but when he started, um, his starting salary was $199,000. So I'm just wow. like I'm a little mind blown <laughs> to say the least. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to hear from you, Martina, and like what, what your experience was, what your starting salary was. And and, and yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, when, when Lauren shared that with me, which was re recently, um, I was mind blown. I still am mind blown about the, the dollar amount. Um, I was not paid that, that salary. I, I think that what this begs the question of is how do you know if you're getting paid fairly? And as Lauren said, it is often taboo to um, speak about pay, whether it's in financial services or somewhere else. And to me, it, it's an opportunity for corporations to really um, have more transparency around pay equity. Um, when I was on the floor, when I started, let me say this, I started out and I believe that I was being paid on par with my analyst class. I came through a traditional uh, internship recruiting process and you know whether or not it was because you know Merrill was one of the larger investment banks and had some more structured HR and compensation policies, not sure. Now, I don't know on a go forward, right, for the follow on years, um, if I was in line with my peers or not. But um, I certainly think that there are some shortfalls that corporate America is experiencing. And uh, as Lauren said, it is generally women and people of color who, um, get left, you know, with the short end of the stick. Um, so I, you know, some places I've worked, you have bands for your title mm -hmm. and you kind, of, you kind of have these guardrails and you know that, all right, well, based on this title, I should be in this band. Um, but I did not have that at the exchange. So I cannot, can, you know, really honestly say if I was being paid on par with uh, other other men that were on my team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so it seems like there's no 
clear cut way of saying like this is the average salary for a trader because it, it ranges a lot based off what you all are saying because like many other industries rarely do people talk about how much they make or you know so that you can see if you're being paid on par or being underpaid is that what you all are saying yeah absolutely i would agree but 100%. but i would also i would also say that regardless if i was being paid on par or not you know the the minimum wage in new york city is what the minimum wage is and was and i was not making minimum wage as a salaried worker in new york city new york um in 2016 in 2017 2018 um so yeah and so i think the big question which this may be a bit of a sidebar but when you think New York City, obviously the first thing people think about is how expensive cost of living is there. So Lauren, how how were you making it during that time? <laughs> you know, I'm I'm so grateful that I had my family. I lived in my grandparents. They, you know, didn't ask for rent, didn't ask for really anything. I used that money strictly for groceries and transportation to and from the New York Stock Exchange. My first two years, you know, when people say, you know, how was it even outside of the trading floor? I didn't get to live this glamorous life of, you know, exploring New York City or going out to eat or going out with friends, um, but because I frankly couldn't afford it. I also, at the time, um, had to get a car as well because I was coming from Jersey. So I had to take my car to um, the PATH station. And so, yeah, my, my car, um, lease was, I want to say like $400 a month. So every, you know, but that is why there's an importance of budgeting and saving. And I've always had that instilled in my mind. I did come from other jobs that paid significantly more. Um, so I did have a bit of money, um, saved up that, you know, was able to keep me afloat. And even during the process, I never thought, Oh, I'm not making a lot of money again. I was very eager. I wasn't even really thinking about the money. I was like, as, soon, as long as I'm budgeting and saving, I, I should be fine. Were there moments where I had to shamefully call my mom to say, can you, you know, put money into my bank account? My bank account overdrafted. Yeah. But, um, you know, all the learning lesson, I can't stress this enough. I, I was I was grateful for it. Um, but how I was doing it was was because of my incredible family. And I would say, you know, that speaks to a bigger conversation around, you know, can, you know, recognizing a little bit of privilege there and the sense of can everybody, can most people afford to be able to take a unpaid internship or to get paid a very low salary to be able to have accessibility to for a platform that could open up many doors for you. And I would say vastly across America, most people are not in a position to do that. And and I do have to recognize and be grateful for the life that I, I came from and the family that I have and the people that are supporting me. But, you know, again, that, that goes back to the conversation of inequalities and how do we close the, the wealth gap and how do we have these conversations? Because a lot of people can't take those risks because of their day to day life. Um, and and I have to stand in that. Yes. And, and I'm so happy you brought that up because I think Oftentimes when companies talk about this this pipeline thing and them trying to expand it, but you also have to realize like who has access to it. Like you said, everyone can't afford to take an unpaid internship or a super low paying entry level job that isn't even minimum wage. And so I'm so happy that you brought that up. Um, but I want to switch gears a bit because switch gears a bit because I know that both of you all have since left the New York Stock Exchange. And so I would love for you all to share um, one why you all left and then two what are you working on now? Because I think both of you are now are doing amazing work in the space of helping, you know, around diversity and inclusion and, and increasing access. Martina, you want to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can definitely go. And and I echo a lot of, of, of the sentiments that um, Lauren just spoke about as it relates to, to pay and equity. And um, it, it's really hard to level the playing field when everyone doesn't have the same prerequisites in terms of access and getting in. Um, I know for me, when I was on the floor, I was surrounded by a number of folks who were um, the kids of CEOs or, um, or, or the nephew or the godson or someone. And um, so our experience just was not the same. Um, I work with a lot of folks who got a chance who, on the weekends were going to Vegas or going to the Hamptons. And I remember thinking, being from Alabama, I was just used to a different, I was more chill, a different lifestyle. But and I focused heavily on, on saving and stacking that paper. So um, as far as the question 
uh, Courtney, I'm sorry, you have to give it to me again. <laughs> oh, what am I doing now? Oh, yes. Okay. So why did I leave? Um, the New York Stock Exchange was a, a wonderful place, a great place to start. It was my first foray into understanding investments and understanding how money flowed um, in terms of you know people coming in and, and trading uh, stock and public publicly traded companies. But uh, it was also uh, very transactional. I was seeing these IPOs come to market. And I think at the end of the day, my intellectual curiosity got the best of me. And I wanted to see the other side of the picture and better understand how deals were being made that really served as a, so I went to business school, but it served as a launch pad for me to explore other things that I was passionate about, um, economic empowerment, financial inclusion. So today I focus very heavily on democratizing access to um, opportunities for, for, for others. And I did that throughout my, throughout my career. So I have a 20 year work history. I, I did it. I went back and worked for uh, SEO, uh, the organization that got me in my foot in the door to Wall Street for five years, helping them to to launch and scale an alternative investments program that focused on early stage talent coming out of investment banking, trying to effectively compete for roles in private equity. Uh, then we also created symbiotic relationships between allocators of capital, like your public pension funds, endowments, and foundations, who were looking for diverse emerging managers to invest in, so people who were going out raising funds. Um, I spent time working with Points of Light, which is uh, former President George H.W. Bush's foundation. And while there, I sharpened my lens around community resiliency. And ultimately today, what I do sits at the intersection between entrepreneurship, uh, wealth creation, and uh, economic mobility. I serve as chief of strategic partnerships for an organization called ACE, Access to Capital for Entrepreneurs. And we are a community development loan fund in Georgia focused on helping small businesses uh, grow those businesses through capital coaching and connections. Uh, I wear a second hat as a venture partner for Zane Venture Fund. And uh, we are really trying to reframe the conversation in VC around diversity, right? Exactly what we're talking about today to some degree. 80% uh, of VC investors are white, 15% represent um, Asians, and then there's about 5% that might represent Black and Latinx. Uh, I think that's directly correlated with the fact that on the other side of the table, for women, only 2% are actually recipients of VC capital. Um, and ultimately, Zane, we are a, a diverse investment team focus on investing in early stage diverse founder founding teams um, with pre-seed and seed capital and we're focused on the southeast. Awesome, awesome. And so you're doing a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know if I'm going or coming on on a lot of days. I, I manage about six or seven different e email boxes. So it is busy. But thank you because the impact that you're having in that space is is phenomenal. And Lauren, I, I want to switch to you. Why did you decide to leave the floor? And can you speak a bit about what you're working on now? Because you also are working on a lot. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, times have changed a little bit on the trading floor. I, I think before it used to be a space where men would, would pretty much stay until that was their entry level job and they would stay until they retired. Um, and now we see through the advancement of technology that uh, trading is, is a lot different, even probably even while you were on the floor, Martina, than how it is now. And so often many people who come to the floor, they at, on average stay for about two years and then they go on and either, you know, stay in finance or they completely pivot. Uh, for me, of, of course, it probably was a very easy decision to leave the floor making the salary that I was making. Um, but I, you know, my, my story went viral and I felt like I had a social responsibility to do more, um, especially when it came to um, women and minorities. And so, and so today now a lot of the work that I do um, is all about empowering the next generation, younger millennials, Gen Zers, when it comes to finance, whether they want to work in finance or whether they want to be better at their personal finances. One of the things that I'm doing um, amongst many other things, but I am now the host of Going Public, uh, which is a streaming show that will be entrepreneur.com that I'm so excited for, but essentially we get to democratize IPOs. Um, and what's really interesting, I had my first um, in-person speaking engagement at Mississippi State last week, and I've been doing many speaking engagements, but they're usually over Zoom and I don't get to actually see the audience, but I'm sitting in the room with, with people 18 and older and I'm explaining to them going public and and they're, you know, excited, but, you know, not really sure what it is all that I'm saying. 
And I said, by a show of hands, does anybody know um, what your net worth needs to be if you want to participate in an IPO? Nobody raised their hands. And once I broke it down saying that essentially you need to have over a million dollars and why going public is so groundbreaking, this gives you guys the accessibility. These are the conversations that we want to hear that are being had, that we are we can actually close the wealth gap, that people will actually have the opportunity to you know, be in a company from the ground floor and and hopefully, you know, you know, invest in the next Amazon, right? Um, so everything that I do today is is an extension of that. I look at um, money and finance from a very holistic standpoint and the sense of, you know, I think we have so many conversations about, you know, how do we have you know, conversations about better negotiating, better salaries. How do I get into finance? And, and I think inherently it all comes back down to the psychology of it. Um, and what is your mindset? And a lot of a lot of the work that I do is, is re really debunking and, and what is people's relationship with money? And so, yeah, I, I have going public. I have a couple of TV series in the works as well as uh, my biopic um, that I'm really excited with AGC Studios. Um, a book and, you know, many other projects that I can't wait for everyone to, to hear. But essentially, me, I get to change the face of finance. I love the incredible people that are in the finance entertainment space, such as, you know, our Jim Kramers and our Susie Orman. But I get to be a different version of that. Um, as a black woman and, and a young black woman and really get to give the exposure to these young kids that they really wanted. And we've seen it during the pandemic, especially with uh, Robin Hood and all the trading that people want to do. But but really, there's no one that that's sitting down, breaking down the fundamentals to them. And I'm glad that I get to be able to do that. Um, so I'm grateful for what this has led and turned into. And and yeah, I'm just excited. Awesome. You know, um, if, if I could add, Courtney, to your here, yeah. I mean, I was nodding a lot when, when Lauren was speaking because all of it, it speaks to me. And um, she talked about mindset. And, and that's certainly a, a takeaway for me from the exchange was to have an equity mindset and not just, you know, when you get your seat at the table to um, use your voice in a meaningful way to help others. Yep. Uh, so I, I remember being on the floor of the exchange and uh, because of my position of being a broker at having a roundtable discussion and saying to uh, other brokers, uh, why don't we have a mock trading night? Because I was doing invested, adopted junior and adopted senior uh, mentorship program for high school students. And similar to what Lauren said, I remember talking to them about what it was that I did and these were inner city New York City kids who live in various boroughs and didn't even know this New York Stock Exchange existed. So it was an opportunity to bring uh, 70, plus, 70 plus scholars to the floor to show them and give them some exposure to this world, mm -hmm. whether or not they ever went into finance or not. And um, having an equity mindset is an ownership mindset. Uh, I learned that from being on the floor of the exchange is what I took with me is that invest in something that is going to return value back to you that's you know dividends and you can leverage for other things whether it was the seat you know at the end of the day i had rights to trade because merrill had that seat but mm -hmm. they reaped all of the economic benefits when the stock exchange went public and those seats topped out a value of three and a half million dollars um not me so i now that i would take the trade all day because at the end of the day i got a chance to get my experience of working on the floor uh, at the exchange and serving as a broker. But today, very similar to Lauren, coming from a, a rural environment where I had livestock in the backyard the first nine years of my life and I lived in a two bedroom mobile home, it um, has always been important to me about, you have to have discipline when you when, with your money before even thinking about investing and really, really good man money management. Because we had a lot of challenges uh, personally when, when my parents got divorced. And, and so that really shaped my thinking. And, and Lauren and I joke about being uh, frugal. I said, I call it being fiscally responsible. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we, we both watch our, 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 our coins, right, um, very closely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And both of you all brought up so many great points. And, and Lauren, one thing that stuck out to me when you mentioned changing the face of finance, and I think even with the work that both of you are doing in terms of just representation and the saying where a lot of times people sometimes say it's hard to be something that you can't see. Yep. And so I think a lot of young people are looking at you all. And even if they don't know anything about the New York Stock Exchange, like you mentioned, Martina, 
they are Googling and trying to figure out, okay, well, what does that look like? How does it look like to get down to that path? Um, so I say all that to say that even still today, when you look at the numbers though, in terms of who's working in this industry, um, there's still a long way to go when it when it comes to diversity. Um, in fact, the nonprofit organization Catalyst reports that less than a quarter of senior leadership roles at financial firms are held by women. And then when you break that down by race for women of color, including Asian women, black women, Latina women, they hold just 2% each of those leadership roles. And so for you all, as women who were former traders on the floor who are still working in the space of increasing diversity and inclusion, what do you think the financial industry as a whole needs to do more of to increase its diversity so that it isn't just lip service? You know, I, I've said this so many times. Uh, one, yeah, it shouldn't be lip, lip service. I think in 2000, anything, the fact that, oh, let's have conferences, let's have board meetings on how we can recruit. I have seen people get jobs overnight and, and you know, C-suite level people have moved mountains to create jobs because they just wanted a person in the company. And so if we can have that same determination to just not just want somebody in the company, right? We still want talented people, but to give people that opportunity, it can be done. This doesn't even need to be a conversation. How do we do this? How do we find it? Uh, you, you, you meet, especially in New York City, you, cro you cross paths with someone who doesn't look like you probably every second, right? You're on the subway, you're, you're mi mixing and mingling with many different people. Um, so there is a part of that, but then I also, again, back to what me and Martina have been saying, also the exposure component. I want people who look like me to feel comfortable with reaching out to people that don't look like themselves. You know, one of the things that I always teach um, is that your network should not look like you. Like if your network is all black women, that's amazing, but I don't know how far they're gonna get you, right? So you want to make sure that you are having a diverse, a group of people around you, but that also helps with just with group think and, and learning different perspectives and learning different cultures. But you have to get comfortable with reaching out to people that don't look like you, being okay to ask for help. I think many people have a lot of pride of not leaning in and asking for help. It is okay. And again, you don't need to have a world of opportunities, many opportunities. You just need to have that one lean all the way in. And what are you going to do with that opportunity? Um, I think as far as the New York Stock Exchange, I, I don't you know, see diversity being an initiative that you know they, they really care about. And that's fine. I think that there are many different places within the financial industry as a whole that we can see big strides moving forward. Um, and all it takes is, again, you know, on both sides of the pendulum, we, we need more people to, to take the risk to apply for these positions, to go to networking events, to, to cold reach out to people, as I did when I got, uh, or how I even got the job at the New York Stock Exchange. But also, if you are a person that is sitting in a leadership position, you should be actively doing the recruiting as well. And um, and helping to develop and mentor once these people get into the company, because I think statistically um, minorities make up a lot of entry level positions. And then once you start go rising up in the ranks, we don't see that as much. Obviously, we just said uh, two percent. Um, so, uh, Courtney, everybody, can you guys hear me? Now I can hear it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so I I got scared. So I, I think, you know, we we definitely I, I don't even want to say we have a far way to go because this is such a problem that can be easily solved. Um, so I think it it kind of just boils down to the to the mindset and the people that are holding these leadership positions and how much it actually means to them. This doesn't need to be a hot topic word. This shouldn't be a hot topic word. This should just be a way of life at this point. And what Sorry. About I felt like yeah. I went on a rant. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's fine. You know, I, I, I agree. It's um, the numbers are daunting that you talked about. And I think sadly they're reflected across so many different sectors mm -hmm. and uh, it feels like a circular reference of this conversation of diversity and how do we improve it? You know, um, I feel like companies need to insert themselves in the ecosystems where diversity lies and um, you can't just do it at the entry level. You have to make sure, I always say that talent is broadly distributed, but it's not always evenly developed. And you mm -hmm. have got to, to develop talent from ground level all the way up through your middle, senior, and then to your board. Evaluate your policies, your procedures. Diversity has to be a part of your culture. 
um, and diversity is good for business. So it should be it should be a part of strategy. Um, but I certainly feel like we should not. If we can figure out sustainable development goals and how to incorporate those, um, then we should be able to figure out pay equity, gender equity. Uh, I, I just think that it is. It, it feels like we are not moving fast enough. And it's great that we have some wins. We're celebrating Rosalind Brewer and Tassanda Duckett, but we're still talking about single digits. If you look at Lauren and I, honestly, we're talking about single digits that 13 years later, Lauren came along and she was number two. It just, just, it's, it's ridiculous in, in many ways. Um, so I, I, I feel like there's proven, there's research that shows that diversity actually pays dividends. If you have a diverse board, you tend to generate 63, 63% higher returns. So if you are not focused on diversity, then you are really, to me, shirking your fiduciary responsibility as an as a organization. Um, so those are just some of my thoughts. Yes, yes. And I love it, I love it all. <laughs> yes, and I was gonna say, we can sit here and we can literally talk for hours because there is so much to talk about. Um, but we're actually running out of time a bit. And, and I want to, because today is Equal Pay Day. And so we spoke a lot about pay equity and, 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 and gender equity. And so Lauren and Martina, I would love for you all to offer, what advice do you have for women when it comes to negotiating your worth in the workplace? And then also what's the best negotiating advice you ever received? And, and Lauren, do you want to go first? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I think, of course, being able to negotiate, you have to know what the starting salary is. Um, even after my article came out, there were so many, especially white women, if I'm being frank, attacking me for saying, well, you didn't negotiate your salary. I don't even know how you negotiate from 12,000. Like, I mean, if I'm being frank, like, how do you negotiate from 12,000 when your counterparts are making 80,000 plus? Like, there's no room for, so one, it's understanding and if, and if you don't understand what, what the salary is, because I think especially like places like the New York Stock Exchange, and, and there are probably other jobs as well where it's not something that you can Google and then what's on Google is really vague and it's yeah. always true. Um, to do your best, take the job, take the risk, get paid minimum wage. Like I'm definitely going to keep pushing that going forward. But once you know that number, then that should be the number that you should hold with you when you're looking for your next job, because it's really hard as an entry level associate or, or any position that you go in, if you're being underpaid or not being on par with your other counterparts to be able to climb yourself up to get paid um, on par with your counterparts. So once you add that number, I, I think, for me, I, I became close friends with someone on the floor who was entry level. He came after me and he told me over drinks one day that he was making 120000 And he was like, oh, how much are you making? I was like, nope, we are not going down that. Not because it was taboo, because I was mostly embarrassed. He was making significantly more than me. But I said, my next job, in my mind, I'm not making anything less than 120000 And I kept that. And I think when we talk about negotiating, you have to own your number. If a company says no to you, I mean, and again, negotiating. So if they, if, if I said 120 and they gave me 115,000, okay, we, we could talk that that's in the same ballpark. But if they, you know, come back 60,000, you have the power to walk away. And I think what often happens, and I know we're, we're getting short on time, so I'm sorry. I think what often happens is people give their power to other people. And one thing that my mom always taught me is that you got to have faith. You have to believe you have to know your worth. You have to say, I am worthy out loud and know that it is going to be okay. Know that whatever number is in your head, you go by that number period. Nobody has that type of power or control over you for you to just say, you know what? I'm not going to get paid my worth. You should always get paid your worth. Um, so I think that that's the best advice that I could give to people. Don't just take it because you feel obligated obligated because you need to know what that, that number is. And once you learn that number, you stick with that number. I, I would not, you know, again, negotiating is a little bit back and forth. But if it is dramatic, you just say you walk away. You say, you know what, there is another opportunity out there because Honestly, there is another opportunity out there, but you have to believe that. And I think especially going back to the mindset, often people don't think that there are other opportunities out there. And there 100% is. And you have to believe that. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, my, my advice is um, state your ask and um, know, state, state your ask and state your value and then be quiet and listen. Um, that is sp specifically for if you've been in a role for, for a while or whatever. For someone just starting out into a new role, you got to be informed going in and try to have some level of a benchmark of, of what the role pays. Um, at, but I think for, there shouldn't be surprises when you're in a row at the end of the year, right? You should, should have these, uh, have a continuous feedback loop, loop, constant conversation, find opportunities to highlight the work that you've been doing uh, with your team, with your direct manager, maybe it's quarterly or monthly. If there's been some stakeholder feedback that's positive, share that so that there is alignment when you get to the end of the year, when you're talking about a bonus or at the end of the year, when you're talking about what your expectations were. So communication is certainly very important. And I agree. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, um, attending Tuskegee University, having great values growing up gave me like this level of assertiveness, um, confidence and courage to not settle, to ask for what it is that I want. And I think that those were all things that were priceless as you know, I went out into the world stage in my career and, and I'm, I'm continuously learning, right? We're, you know, Lauren and I have conversations about different things and mm -hmm. it's important to have a circle of advice of, of a, a board of advisors, so to speak, um, that can give you feedback, that can pull your coattail. And sometimes you have to realize, okay, well, maybe there's a middle ground. I didn't get everything that I wanted, um, but what's the, the total compensation package look like? Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, helpful too, as you go through and navigate. And then at the end of the day, you got to have an exit strategy. If it's mm -hmm. not what you want, if it doesn't get you to where you want to be, have an exit strategy, move forward boldly and, and, and confidently and walk in that. Yeah, I totally agree. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more with, with both of you all. So it's know your number, communicate your value, know your power and walk away if you feel like someone isn't meeting you at your value. Yep. Lauren and Martina, thank you so, so, so much for this conversation. We're so happy to have had you all today. Um, before we go, can you let everyone who's tuned in know where they can follow you all? Because I know you all are also on social media. Yeah, so I am um, on Instagram, LA Simmons. Uh, you could also follow me on LinkedIn at Lauren Simmons. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, LinkedIn is where you can find me. You can also find me on uh, IG or Twitter. It's Martina N. Edwards on those two platforms. Uh, so. Looking forward to connecting with folks. And then you can actually go to my website too, martinamarshalledwards.com. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Martina and Lauren. And thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney, NBC. This has been great. <laughs>